It's been an awesome five weeks as we've gone through Matthew chapters 8 and 9, and now we're going to be looking a little bit at Matthew chapter 10, and um, we've been looking at Jesus doing miracle after miracle and after miracle. If, you, if you've been a part of this series, I've been saying every week, kind of reminding, like Matthew wrote this section of scripture very intentionally to remind us that this Jesus, he is not just a prophet, he is not just a great leader, he's not just an amazing teacher, this is God, and he has power and authority over every aspect of creation, and we can trust him. We can believe him and we can rely on him. And, and today I'm really excited about finishing up this series because when you look at Matthew chapter 10, any of you who have read this section of scripture, you may have questions like, why is this included with Matthew 8 and 9? And by the way, if you haven't, I've been asking every week for you guys to do it. And, and I, I would still really encourage you to read Matthew 8, 9, and 10. It will, it will bless you. It will encourage you. It will empower you because there's no way I can cover it all in the time that we have. Um, but Matthew 10 is a little bit distinct and different because in Matthew 8 and Matthew 9, Jesus is doing the miracle and the disciples are just along for the ride. Kind of like Pastor Stephen was saying, um, the, the, the mouse on the elephant. And by the way, before, before I forget to do this, can we just give him a, a, a thankfulness, man? It was so good last week. Um, I, was, I was riding... I was riding back up from Gainesville, Georgia. If you didn't, guys didn't know where I was at, I was at a marriage conference with my wife. It was really good. Uh, we got to hang, hang out with Jensen Franklin and Craig Rochelle a little bit. If y'all don't know, Craig, Craig Rochelle is genuinely like my man crush. Like, I just want to be him when I grow up. If you don't know who he is, you should look him up. Incredible man of faith. We were, we were driving up, and we were watching Pastor Stephen, and, and he was a blessing. If you, if you don't know, every one of our pastors, they really genuinely could be leading their own churches somewhere. That's one of the secret sauces um, of Ignite. We have some incredible gifted men men and women that are serving you and, and they love you and, and they're with you. But um, uh, today, as we finish this up, we're going to be looking at something that um, I think is it's the most important part of the story. In, in Matthew 8 and 9, we, we see Jesus doing the work of miracles and we see his disciples watching it. They're observing it, they're in awe of it, and they're glorifying God through it. In Matthew 10, we see the disciples go, coming from observing to partnering in the miracle. So Matthew 10, 1, if you guys want to pull out your phone, you may. The outline's right there. If you have the piece of paper, you can go ahead and look at that as well. Matthew 10, 1, it says, And when Jesus had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power. He gave them power. That's, I want you guys to, to highlight that or underline that. As a matter of fact, we all just kind of humor me. This, you know, it helps us preach better. So if, if we know you're not asleep, you know, on the count of three, can we just all in together and be unified and just, just, just declare power? So one, two, three, power. Yeah, the, the, some of you were a little delayed, but that's okay, too. Jesus loves you. It's all right. The, the Greek word for this word power is the word dynamis. And you, might, you may guess that it's the root of the word dynamite. So when, when, Jesus, when it says that he gave them power, he gave them power, first of all, over unclean spirits. So he gave them power over the spiritual world. And then he says to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. From, in this section in Matthew 10, the reason why I wanted to connect it to the miracle series is that we see the disciples going from being an observer of the miracle to our participant in the miracle. And it's a really humbling thing, and it's a really exciting thing, and it's a really encouraging thing, and it's a really true thing. To, I want you to understand that Jesus wants you not to just observe him working miracles. He wants you and me to be a part of the miraculous. And now, I know that for many of you, <clears throat> when, you when I talk about this stuff, you will mentally assent and agree with what I'm saying. When I say to you that Jesus wants you to be a part of his miracles, when he wants you to be a part of the supernatural, when he wants you to be a part of the miraculous, like you say, yeah, I understand that. That's what a Christian does. But I, if, I, if I dare say, and I, I might not be talking to you, but I think I'm talking to most of you, really, if you're honest with yourself, you don't believe that Jesus wants you to be a part of the miraculous. Most of us in this room, if we're really real, we're just trying to make it through the week. We're just trying to make it through our paycheck. We're just trying to make it through school. We're just trying to make it through our kids' school. Man, homework is getting hard. My daughter's in fifth grade. It's crazy. Like we're, just trying, we're just trying to make it through life. And then someone gets up on the stage and talks about, Jesus wants you to be a part of the miraculous. And it sounds good. But you're like, man, I, ain't got, I, don't have, I don't have time for the miraculous. I don't have energy for the miraculous. And I'm not so sure that what Jesus said to the disciples applies to me. Well, our first point is this. I want you to write this down, and we'll discuss it a little bit. The same miraculous Holy Spirit of Christ lives in you. That is a core tenet of being a New Testament Christian, that that same Holy Spirit that, 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 that lived and reigned in Jesus and allowed him to perform the miracles, to raise the dead, to open the eyes of the blind, to allow the lame to walk, to, part, to, to walk on the sea, to calm the storm, that same miraculous power that, that Jesus had living in him, if you are a New Testament believer, that same power lives in you. 
And I think sometimes we forget that and we're just trying to go through life the way that a Christian is supposed to live. And some of you, there's not a blank for this, but some of you, you might want to write this down. There's all kinds of places on the app you can write stuff and same thing with your notes. I really believe that Christians are called to live what I would call a naturally supernatural life. And it's a struggle to do that. It's naturally supernatural. And some of you say, well, what does that even mean? Nice, nice rhetoric, you know, way to rhyme there a little bit, Jason. But what does naturally supernatural mean? Well, here's what it means to me. And I, it might only make sense to me, but I think it'll make sense to you if I explain a little bit. Um, I see a lot of Christians in America, and we are so blessed and I'm so thankful for where we are. But I see a lot of Christians in this area that what I would call them, I say they're natural Christians. And what do you mean by that? Well, they say they're a Christian. But by the way they walk and the way they talk and the way they think and the way they live and the way they spend their money and the way they do their marriage and the way they raise their kids, you would never, ever know they were a Christian unless you saw them at church on Sunday. And some of y'all know people like that. But they'll say all day long they're a Christian, but they're living in the natural. They're living as a natural man or a natural woman. They're living as though they don't have the Holy Spirit of God living in them. And then all of us probably have had experiences with the other extreme and what I call the cuckoo crazy Christians. You know what I mean? Like, they're so supernaturally focused that they're no natural good at all. The big hair, the gold thrones, the in the name of Jesus, everything. You know, like, and they see, they see a demon behind every bush, and, and, and they bring out the snakes. And, you know, yeah, the crazy stuff. And when you look at it, it's like, well, if that's what it means to have the Holy Spirit, I'm going to be jumping pews, I'm going to be falling out, and snakes are going to be calling over me. No, thank you, Jesus. I do not want that either, you know? And so we, we, we have these two extremes of, of this, these people that you can just, there's no spirit in them. And these people, they seem to have spirit, but I don't know what kind of spirit it is, but I don't want it. <laughs> and I really believe that where God wants us as a church to be is, is this naturally supernatural. No, you, you, you are not meant to live as a natural man or natural woman, but that doesn't mean that you're crazy. It doesn't mean that you're knocking down every door and bashing people over the head with the Bible. It doesn't mean that you have to anoint every, every tree and every home and every aisle with, with anointing oil, but it also doesn't mean that you ignore the needs that are right in front of your face. I really believe Ignite Church that Jesus has called you to reach your neighbors. And, and, and you say, well, how do I do that? Well, how you do that is you get to know them. You go and you knock on your door and you, you let them know that you live across from them or beside them, and you, and you begin to develop a relationship with them. And while you're doing that, y'all, you ask them, how is your marriage going? How are your kids doing? What things are happening at your work? How can I pray for you? And I know for some of you, like you hear that with your head, and you're like, you know, that sounds good, but I could never do that. I don't know that we have an option whether we get to do that or not. If we're going to be obedient to the God of life, we have to, we have to, we have to be living this naturally supernatural life. And here's the thing, some of you say, well, if I did that, and it would, it would change our relationship. Yeah, it would change your relationship for the better. There is, there's no one in Greenville that I've ever met that minds me praying for them, that minds me lifting them up, that minds me encouraging them. There's no one I've ever met that doesn't want for, for blessings to come to their home, for blessings to come to their children, for blessings to come. There's no one I've ever met. When people are struggling in their marriage, there's no one who has a struggling marriage. And I say, can I pray for your marriage? And I say, heck no, nobody does that. And so all these fears that we have of, of, of being this man or woman that's really involved in the lives of others, those are Satan-originated and inspired fears. And we got to get over them because you're here for more than your job. You're here more than just to be a good parent. You're here. You're definitely here more, for more than hearing me preach. You are here to be a partner in the mission of the miraculous. And so that's what we're going to be talking a little bit about today. And before we dive into it and we get into the points of how we can live this out in a practical way, I want to say this to you. And you really, I want you to have your ears very well attended to what I'm about to say. If you do not feel that you are called to be a part of the miraculous, that probably means that that Holy Spirit that draws us to the miraculous does not live in your life. You see what I'm saying? If you are not drawn to be a part of the miraculous, that probably means that though you assent to who Jesus is in your mind, that you may believe that he died on the cross, that you may assent to the fact that he, was, he is God wrapped in flesh with your mind, it has never penetrated your heart because the moment that the gospel penetrates your heart, you are filled with the Holy Spirit of the living God. You are not a natural man or a natural woman anymore. You are a new creature in Christ. And for some of you in this room, I love you. That's why I say this. For some of you, for all of your singing, for all of your serving, for all of your giving and all you do, you are just religious. You're not supernatural. And the only people who are going to be in the kingdom of heaven are spirit-filled men and women who are supernatural beings by the power of Jesus. And so today might be your day. Like, if, if that's where you're at, I'm not trying to heap condemnation on you, but I am saying you need to surrender your life to Jesus today because when you really do that, he will change 
everything. Let's dive into what it looks like to be this naturally supernatural person. So because the Holy Spirit lives in us, number one, guys, we will go and impact our world with power. Because the Holy Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead lives in your life. See, that's the thing. When you have the Holy Spirit, you do not have to live in defeat anymore. You do not have to live in doubt anymore. We are victorious. And that doesn't mean things are always good. It doesn't mean things are always easy. But it always means that we are not alone in it. We're with God. And he is with us. So when I see Christians that are, that are, that are, that are really like defeated, I want to remind them, no, 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 the spirit in you is never defeated because that same spirit rose Jesus from the dead. And whatever it is you're facing, that spirit can conquer it in your own life. Look at what Jesus said over his disciples. Matthew 10, 7, this is so good. It says, as you go, preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Now provide neither gold or silver or copper in your money belts, nor a bag for your journey or two tunics nor, nor sandals or staffs, for a worker is worthy of his food. And see, here we have Jesus, and he's, he's given them now authority to go and, 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 and touch the miraculous. And he says, look, I want you, I'm not following you anymore. You're not, you're not going to just watch me go anymore. I'm sending you out, and I'm expecting you to be the bearers of the miracle. And when I, when I read this, I can't help but wonder, like, how did the disciples feel when Jesus was laying this out over them? You know, I think sometimes we assume, well, they felt confident. They felt co courageous. They felt assured. I can just say this. If this little preacher boy was a part of that group, I'd have been scared to death. I'd have been scared to death. Okay. So, I mean, you know, like, like they haven't done any miraculous works yet. They've just watched Jesus do it. Now he's like, by the way, you go do it. And it's like, well, you know, I know you can do it but I'm not so sure about me. So, so you're sending me to the graveyard with the guy who can break chains and now I'm supposed to cast the demon out into the pigs. I'm not so confident about that. You're put, people are gonna be tearing up the roots and they're gonna be laying lame men at my feet and I'm supposed to tell them to walk and I'm expecting them. They're gonna, I'm not so sure about that. I, I have to believe that at least some of the disciples, maybe Dalton Thomas, if not, none of the others, were just like, I'm not so sure that what you're saying really applies to my life, Jesus. It sounds good, but I'm not sure it's for me. You see, the kicker here, though, is I think that Jesus intended for them to have to go forward with uncertainty. You know what I'm saying? Like, like what we want, what all of us want, we want to know that God will do the miracle, and we say, God, when you will promise me that you'll do the miracle, then I'll go and be the bearer of the miracle. You know what I mean? Like, if you knew that God would heal everyone at the hospital who you touched today, I know all of you would go to the hospital. Can I get an Amen. Come on now. If, you, if you're not amen and then you're just cruel and heartless and you need to leave. <laughs> Can I mean? Like if, if God told you, hey, you look, just at your touch and at your word, everybody's going to be jumping out of the bed over at Violent. So just go. Well, we would go. But no, he, God doesn't operate that way. He says, you go first, obey first, trust me first, and then the result is up to me whether I show up or not. You see, in my own life, I... I see a scripture like this, and, and I begin to, to forget the fact that I can't save anyone. I can't heal anyone. I can't change anyone. I just get to be obedient, and Jesus saves, Jesus heals, and Jesus changes. And it's the same for you. Some of you need to write that down. We can't save anyone, but the God in heaven says the results belong to me. Will you be obedient and go? Right after the first service, um, a lady approached me. She's like, Jason, she's like, there's one thing the Holy Spirit told me while you were preaching. And it was good. So I was like, yeah, I, I, I told her I'd share it. She's like, it's kind of like if somebody called you and, and said, listen, um, I want you to come out to California and I've got a train ticket waiting for you at the station. And she's like, you, they didn't send it in the mail. You got to go to the station and believe that the ticket is there. This, this last weekend for this marriage conference, um, Will and Norma Barnes, who are part of our church family, they invited my wife and I to go. And um, I, I'll be honest, it was a blessing to go, but Will and Norma arranged a trip. So they came and they picked us up. I was not in the driver's seat, which is hard for every man, and all the men say amen. Come on. You're, if you don't say it, you're lying, okay? Because we all, we all had to be. So, so he, he was driving. He made the hotel arrangements. They had the tickets. We just had to go. And, when it, and there was that moment, like, when we get to the conference, and it's like, what's your name? And we say, Limeburger. And it's like, I hope they have a ticket for Limeburger. Otherwise, I'm stuck in Gainesville, Georgia, with nothing else to do with my wife, which would be fine. But, you know, like, like, we just had to believe in faith that it was there. So I, I want to speak it over you. Jesus isn't going to give you the assurance of the miracle until you're willing to go unassured. You go and be obedient and leave the results up to him. In this last section of 
this passage, you know, you may wonder, why did you include the, the, the tunic and the money belt and that kind of whole thing? Like the other part's exciting to go and cast out demons and heal the sick. What, what does that have to do with anything? I think Jesus was telling the disciples, and I'm telling all of you, whatever excuses are keeping you from doing what Jesus has told you to do, from obeying his call, just get him. Jesus says, don't worry about your, your money. Don't worry about your clothes. Don't even worry about your walking sticks. I got all that. You just obey me and leave provision up to me as well. We are supposed to be a part of the miraculous. And I promise you guys, if you're willing to trust and obey and leave the results to Jesus, he will use your life to bring others into a place of salvation. So number one, go impact your world with power. Paul said this as well. Some of you, because I know I include this passage because some of you are like, well, the disciples are different. They're different. You know, Jesus breathed over them. <sighs> Bible scholars, you know, like, you know, I mean, some of you, I know that's what you're saying. Well, like, uh, they, have a, they had a different anointing. And in some regard, you may be right. But just to kind of illustrate that this isn't just something for those 12. This is something for all of us. Paul was not there when Jesus breathed for the disciples. As a matter of fact, the beginning of Paul's story is he was persecuting and killing Christians. And yet the God of heaven looked at that murderer and that persecutor and decided, I can use his life to change the world. I can use his life to encourage the church. And I can use his life to do the miraculous. Because remember, Paul's the guy. That his, he was so full of the Holy Spirit they, that they would take handkerchiefs, give them to Paul. Paul would give them to the disciples, and they would take them out to people, and people who touched the handkerchiefs would be healed. Paul's the guy that he was apparently such a boring preacher. Somebody fell, uh, fell out of sleep and, and died in the middle of his sermon, and he just raised them back up and kept on preaching. <laughs> in the name of Jesus. You know, like, yeah. what would that be like? It'd be, it'd be hard to top that, like, punctuation mark on your sermon when you did that. But if Paul can use a persecuting, murdering man to pour out the miraculous, can't he use your life? And look at what Paul had to say about himself. 1 Corinthians 2 says, and I, and this is Paul speaking about himself, and I, brothers, when I came to you, I didn't come with excellent speech. I didn't come with wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of what, Ignite your Say it out, in demonstration of the Spirit. And Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but the power of God. Whatever your excuse is, you need to leave it at the door because God wants to use your life, and he will use your life if you'll go forth in obedience. Number two, guys, write this down. Because the Spirit lives in us, we also trust in the Savior of our story. We trust in the Savior of our story. Uh, this week, I had the uh, unique blessing of going back to my home church, West End Baptist Church in, uh, in Williamston, North Carolina. And it's really fun because um, uh, this is kind of just an aside thing, but it's pretty cool. Um, an igniter is now the pastor of that church, uh, a gentleman named Henry who was a part of our congregation for several years. He went back to my old home church, and he's leading them and doing a, a great job. But I got to go do a wedding yesterday there at my home church and got to see all the ladies that raised me and saw me in diapers and saw me probably without diapers and all those other, other things. And it was really cool. And, and just to encourage all of you at Night Church, everyone that, that I talked to, and I talked to, I mean, you know, everybody, um, they are all so excited and so in awe of the miracles that God is doing at Ignite. So if you, just so you know, like, other people, when they see our church, they are celebrating because what's happening here is a miracle. It's a miracle. It's we're a part of it, so sometimes we miss it, but other people are looking at what God is doing here and they're saying, it is miraculous. And so many people said something like this to me. Jason, could you have ever imagined that your story would go like this? That this would be a part of your story? And the, and the, and the truth is, no, I couldn't have imagined this. The truth is, no, we couldn't have imagined all of you. The truth is, no. But God wants to use all of our stories to draw people into his kingdom. So look at what Jesus continues to say to the disciples. Matthew 10, 18, it says, You'll be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. And when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak. For it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaks in you. Uh, another part of the weekend that was humbling is um, I got to hang out with uh, a lady who was my mother's best friend. It was actually her, her, her um, granddaughter who was getting married. Her name is Miss Glenda. And Miss Glenda's been following on Facebook all the stuff that's been happening with the twins. A lot of y'all have been praying for them in their speech. And Miss Glenda, she was sitting down with me. And, you know, when, 
she is one of those ladies that has seen me with my diaper on and with my diaper off and helped change me when my diaper was off. No, no, that's thing. She can just say anything she wants to in your life and you can just say, yes, ma'am. You know what I mean? Like, she's one of those people in my life. And, uh, and she's like, Jason, so how are you feeling about the twins and all that stuff? And I was like, well, we're concerned. And she's like, you don't need to be concerned about nothing, boy. You don't need to be concerned about nothing. She's like, I remember when you were three years old, no one could understand a freaking word you said. <laughs> Seriously. She's like, she's like, Jason, you have a lisp right now. Like you're, you're officiating my granddaughter's wedding, and every time you say the S word, I have to like listen to what, and I'd forgotten that. And it's true, like when, my, when I was in kindergarten, I did speech therapy. And I'd forgotten, I'd forgotten that. And she's like, no one, under, like, you talked all the time when you were little, but no one had any idea what you were saying. And she said, and look at what God's doing with your mouth. Yes, Lord. Right now, I say that to, to, to remind all of you what, Whatever it is that you feel like God has to overcome before he can use you, he's already overcome it in Jesus. Your story is valuable because Jesus has changed and has redeemed and has transformed your story. And again, if you're here and you, and you can't think of a story of how Jesus has changed your life, if, you're not made, if you haven't been made new because of Jesus, then we love you and today is the day you're gonna be made new in his name. Can I get an Amen. Because our Jesus changes stories, and he's changed your story, and that story is enough. Jesus says, when you get in front of the king, you don't have to prepare a speech. You just talk about me and how I've changed your story, and that is enough. Number three, because of that Holy Spirit, we understand that the world will not understand. You see, it would not be fair of me to preach this message and and say that when you trust Jesus and when you love Jesus and when you follow Jesus, life is going to be great. Everyone is going to love you. Everything's going to work out for your best. You know, rainbows and unicorns and meadows and flowers everywhere you go. That's just not the truth. We have a very real enemy in this life. His name is Satan. He hates all of you. And if you're married, he hates your marriage. And if you have children, he hates your children. And if you have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb, he hates you with a special hatred because he hates you that he cannot own you any longer. And he will do all he can to steal your joy. He will do all he can to ruin your testimony. He will do all he can to frustrate you and make you believe that this whole miraculous thing is not true for your story. And we have to endure this persecution. Jesus, speaking to his disciples, said this, Matthew 10, 24. He says, a disciple is not above his teacher, and a servant is not above his master. It's enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher or a servant like his master. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebub, which is another word for, for Satan, demon, how much more would they call all of you? How much more would they call all of you? Therefore, do not fear them, for there's nothing covered that will not be revealed, and there's nothing hidden that will not be known. Again, this week, God revealed some of this in me. You know, my wife and I had this wonderful marriage conference experience and really empowered and encouraged, and, and it, was, it was so good. And, you know, I kind of had, had Sunday off and got to come back charged up and Monday ready, you know, ready. Like, man, this is going to be a special, amazing week. And then at 5.30 Monday morning, I started getting messages from some of you. Hey, I got this weird email asking for money. Is it you? Because I got your back, guessing if you need it. But if it's not you, I, ain't gonna, I don't want to give them nothing. And if y'all don't know, this week we, Ignite Church was a victim of an internet scam. Someone went on our website and pulled my picture off our website. They created an email that's very similar to my work email here at Ignite Church. And they blasted it out to, to several of you asking for money. And so all day Monday, we were trying to get the word out about the scam and recover from the scam. And I knew in the midst of it, Satan, he, he, was, trying to, he was trying to discourage me and say, look, look, you think you're ready to do something great. You think that you got a word from God. You think God's going to use you this week. And I'm telling you, I can ruin your reputation. I can destroy your church. I can rob from your people anytime I want to. That's what Satan was telling to me. And I had to have that moment of decision of like, am I going to rest in the truth of God's miracles or am I going to believe the lies of Satan? You all will have to face the same type of things if you really walk this natural, supernatural life. You're gonna gonna get to that mountaintop and feel like you finally arrived. And guess what? That's the exact moment that Satan's gonna try to slap you across the face and knock you back down to the valley. And he does it in all kinds of ways. Our marriage, our kids, our finances, our, our work, our life. He does it in all kinds of ways. But in those moments where he slaps us with something, We can choose to live in defeat or we can choose to embrace the victory Jesus has already bought us. Because no matter what kind of stuff Satan wants to do on the internet, I know who my God is and I know my home and I know what Jesus has for me and for all of you. 
And so we don't get to decide if we're going to be persecuted. We will be persecuted. People will not understand. We are going to have challenges. We are going to have weakness. We live in a broken world, and we are going to be broken at times by it. But we have the ultimate victory in Jesus Christ. And we have to choose. Are we going to embrace that? Or are we going to allow the circumstances of our life to take us to places the enemy wants us to go? Jesus told his disciples from the very beginning, understand that not everybody's going to understand. Understand it's not going to always be easy. Understand that you're going to be attacked. Understand you're going to be misunderstood. But do what is right anyway. Love me anyway. Trust me anyway. And believe in the miraculous anyway. And finally, guys, because of the Holy Spirit that lives in us, I want to encourage you with this. Remember the reward. Remember that in the highs and in the lows, in the good and the bad and the ugly, in the days that are full of joy, in the days that are full of sorrow, this God who sees it all, remember that in all we walk through, he is with us, he loves us, and he rewards those that are faithful unto him. Matthew 10, 41, Jesus finishes this kind of sending with this. This is what he says. He says, he who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward, and he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives even one of these little ones a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, basically in my name, and then look at what the next word is. Some of y'all need to highlight that. It says, assuredly. Y'all remember, Ignite, that means amen. It is so. Assuredly, I say to you, that person will not lose their reward. We need to remember that we have a God in heaven that is watching us with love, with grace, with mercy, but also with expectation. Will you turn to your neighbor and just say, God expects great things from you. Go ahead. God expects great things from you. And then the other side, you too. You, yeah, whatever. Yeah, you too. God expects great. I just want to say that. Like, Ignite church. Ignite church. God expects great things from you. Not because of your gifts, not because of your strength, not because of your power, but because his spirit lives in you. And you have the potential to make an eternal difference in lives every single day. And you will not lose your reward for doing so. As a matter of fact, Paul explained it in a little more detail. We'll, we'll speak this and then I want to to send you out with power, and I want us to have an opportunity to go to the Lord with praise and with prayer. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, he says, now if anyone builds on this foundation, and let me remind you what the foundation is. By the way, this is the biggest miracle of all the miracles that Jesus ever did. The greatest miracle was not allowing the blind to see. The greatest miracle was not making the lame to leave. The greatest miracle was not raising the dead to life. The greatest miracle was forgiving the weight of our sin. Can I get an Amen. That's the greatest miracle. He purchased that, that miracle. He couldn't win it with the word. He couldn't do it by, by spitting and making mud. He had to purchase that miracle by his blood on the cross. Greatest miracle of heaven. And so when Paul says the foundation given to you, he's saying that's the foundation of faith and trust in Jesus. My prayer for all of you is that you have that foundation. And if today you do not have that foundation, you're going to have it before you leave today. I believe it with all my heart. But he says, upon that foundation, we have a choice of what we do. On that, we build on that foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw. And each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it. Because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work, which he's built on it, endures, he will have a reward. What Paul is very eloquently and beautifully saying, let me simplify to you. He's saying, our God watches how we live. And today, you and I, after this time of worship is done, we're going to go out into the world. Let's just be real. And we get to decide how we're going to live out our day. And so as we go out and, and live out our day, we can live out our day with ourselves in mind, by default. That's what we typically do. Or we can go out and live out our day with the kingdom in mind. And what Paul's saying is like, when you go out and live your day with yourself in mind, it's like you're building on this perfect foundation of Christ with, with wood or with hay or with straw. You know, common things, flimsy things. So as you go out, and I, I might be making some of you feel guilty. I might be stepping into the meddling zone. <laughs> I'd be careful. Um, if you go out today, for instance, like you're going to binge your Netflix today <laughs> or you're going to binge sports today, there's nothing wrong with those things. But I would encourage you before you go out and just give your time away, give the priority of your life away, that you and I, that we would take a moment and say, Jesus, here's what I want to do today. But my life doesn't belong to me anymore. So what do you want me to do today? Because there may be something better than Netflix waiting for me. There may be something more meaningful than, than basketball waiting for me. There may be something bigger for me than what I would have for myself. And I'm willing to obey you 
and follow your will. One of the things we say at Ignite all the time is that we're raising up an army, not an audience. You're not here just to soak in something Jesus has for you. You are here to get empowered and encouraged to do Christ's work in this world. And I believe he has a plan and a purpose for your day today. And so I want us to take a moment and consider what are we going to build today on the foundation that Jesus has laid for us? Because God says, listen, if you give your days to me, if you give your moments to me, if you give the priority of your heart to me, it's like you're building on this foundation with gold and silver and precious stones. And on the day of judgment, when that fire comes and and judges the work, the fruit of your life, if you keep me as the focus, you will be rewarded because it will endure. So for some of you, the Holy Spirit's gonna say, I want you to take a nap today. And you'll say, amen, Jesus, and it'll be good. For others of you, though, that's your plan, but God has another plan for you. He says, I want you to call someone today. I want you to pray over someone today. I want you to knock on someone's door today. I want you to write a letter for someone today. I want you to make amends today. I want you to love your spouse today. I want you to spend time with your kids today. It's the last thing you want to do. But if you will do it, God will bless it, and you will be a part of the miraculous because we have a miracle working God. But before you can build anything, you gotta have the foundation. And that foundation rests only in Jesus. You have nothing to do with that foundation. Here's the gospel. And some of you today, you came not to learn how to be a better Christian. You came to receive Christ as the true Lord of your life today, and today is your day. Because if you don't remember the story of how he changed your life, that means he hasn't happened, it hasn't happened yet. But today is gonna be your day. In order to to receive this good news, we have to do a few things. First of all, we have to realize our own brokenness. And guys, as beautiful as all of you are, and as wonderful as our church is, can we just, we're a broken church. It doesn't, anyone on the outside can see that you're not perfect, that you've made mistakes. And sometimes it's hard for us to see our own, our own sin. But every single one of us, we've, we've missed the mark. And so when we realize that and and see this perfect and powerful God, there's there's a problem there. Sin cannot be in his presence. The dirtiness of my life has no place in the perfection of heaven. But God sent his son, perfect, pure, spotless, good, full of power, full of wisdom, full of grace and full of mercy. He sent him from heaven to earth, not only to live in front of us so we could see how to live, but to die for us to die for us. And when Jesus died, what that did is God says, I will put all of your shame on his blood. I will account all your wrongs to his account. And if you will trust that Jesus is enough, if you'll trust that the cross is enough, if you will truly believe in the power of that miracle of God, you will be saved and you will be changed. And that change in you will give you confidence to go to the people around you. It'll give you confidence to overcome that addiction that's ensnared you. It'll give you confidence to step forward as a new man or a new woman in your marriage or as a new parent with your children. It will give you the power of heaven. And so if you don't have that, today is your day. So let's bow our heads and let's call out to the God who died for us and let's believe that his blood is enough. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are a miracle working God full of love and grace and mercy and truth. And we profess to you today that we are broken and need to be healed. We profess to you, Father, that we've missed the mark, but we believe in what your Son has done on our behalf. So, Father, for all of us in this room, all of us, We declare the power of the cross. We believe and trust in the forgiveness of sin through the blood of Jesus. And we believe that that you will use even us, that you will change even us, and that you will fill even us with this same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead. We attest it, we believe it, and we are ready to carry this message to the world. So Father, forgive us. Father, redeem us, and Father, make us new.
every head bowed, every eye closed. I know some of you in this room, that is the prayer of your heart. You are, you are declaring today, I am not a natural man. I am not a natural woman anymore. Today, I am filled with the Spirit of God. Today, I am made new. And today, I am ready to live that new creation life. If I'm speaking to you, nobody's looking but me. But I want to see who you are. And so with courage and confidence, if, I, if that is the prayer of your heart, Lord, fill me with power. Fill me with strength. Use my life to change the lives of others because of the blood of Jesus over me. Would you just raise your hand right now? Raise it up high, unashamed. I believe in the blood of Christ. I believe in the power of the Spirit. I believe you will use my life to change the lives of others. Hold them up high. Don't keep them down. Come on now. I see you guys on the side. I see you here in the front and middle. I see you on the other side as well. My life belongs to Jesus. You can put your heads down. Your heads down. Everyone, raise your heads and look at me. We are a church that believes in the miraculous. And so here's what we're going to do. Whether you've made a first-time commitment or recommitment or, or you're just resting in the commitment, can we all pray together that sinner's prayer, believing that today is a day that God is going to give us victory through the blood. We all just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I love you. Thank you for forgiving me wash me cleanse me make me new and help my life be an example of your light and love to the world thank you for your spirit and thank you for your son I trust him in his name the name of Jesus Amen Guys, can we celebrate God? A God who changes lives. Amen.